Uh, it's very, very rare indeed that a professor can condense everything they're going to say on one side of a piece of paper. <laughs> let alone an author. And, uh, and I've tried to do that tonight on a yellow piece of paper somewhere around your seat. And on the back there's absolutely nothing, which uh, ought to be a good thing. We're talking about the, uh, the fullness of Christ uh, going throughout the world. And uh, when, I, when I think about that, I think about uh, how uh, the spirit of Christ and love is, and, and, and all the texts of Scripture are really need to pervade all culture, uh, whether that is the insidious parts of a Canadian culture, and I are a Canadian, uh, or if it's other aspects as well, as far as way as uh, Ethiopia or even Australia such. But tonight, I want to focus on uh, living out the slavery text today. Well, you say I'm free. <laughs> that gets me off the hook. But I, I, I think as we look at them, uh, there, there are a lot of things within the slavery text that, that should impact us as Christians. And so that's what we're going to talk about. It really comes as, as a little bit of a synopsis of this particular book. It was written by William J. Webb. I have no idea who that is. Same name as mine, but apparently it keeps getting attributed to me. Um, and, and depending on the occasion, I either accept the uh, attribution or deny it. My students tell me that if you're on an airplane reading this book, it reads a lot better if you flip the cover underneath. You know? <laughs> I don't know why. But uh, slaves, women, and homosexuals exploring the hermeneutics of cultural analysis. Uh, I am working on another book. Well, at least I've got the title down. <laughs> uh, it's 101 Reasons Why You Should Never Write a Book Entitled Slaves, <laughs> Women, and Homosexuals. I have a hundred more, I have a thousand and one reasons. At any rate, uh, some of the thoughts are reflected from there. Slavery texts often trouble the soul. I remember as a young child, uh, and I had opportunity to share this with uh, this evening at the table. I remember as a young child, uh, driving from Canada down to Baltimore, Maryland, right during the time of the riots. and. Uh, my dad was going back to Hopkins to do a PhD in public health um, and uh, so my mother opened a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin and we read it four boys on our travel down there and it made a lasting impact and we talked about uh, uh, black and white tensions in the states how it might be different different from or similar to uh, Canada and uh, it was uh, it was it made a huge impact on my life I, I think about that and i think about some of the slavery texts that i read and oh dear they trouble my soul okay and, and i think that's true of a lot of christians um, even non-christians as well uh, like to serve these texts up uh, my neighbors on occasion at a New Year's Eve party uh, <laughs> after several martinis it was amazing what they were uh, willing to talk about uh, <laughs> and uh, one of them brought up the beating text in scripture and I will tell you my response to them in a moment but uh, say take a text like uh, Exodus 21 um, at, at times uh, with my students I'll put a $20 bill out and say if any of your pastors have preached this within the last year um, the $20 bill is yours uh, I have never lost a $20 bill as desperate as students are for getting a $20 bill you know never lost but this text reads like this, If a man beats his male or female slave with a rod, and the slave dies as a direct result, he must be punished. But he is not to be punished if the slave gets up after a day or two, since the slave is his property. 
Now, uh, a text like that ought to trouble the soul. Okay, first of all, it, it enshrines the right of a master to beat their slave. The Bible. Uh, a text like that permits rather severe beatings. As long as they get up after a day or two. And rather than rejecting the notion of people as property, it cites that notion as a basis for what it talks about. I think about a text like that and it troubles the soul just a wee bit. Or, a uh, $20 bill if you heard this one preached late, lately. Hey, the, you seen the, uh, the sermon titled, Bad, uh, Big Bad Goring Bulls? You'll know what, what text it's talking about. It's talking about text from Exodus 21. And uh, basically, if a bull is in the habit of going, goring, you know, if you if, uh, just place yourself in an apartment building. If you have a bull, you know, occasionally you're going to have to let it go up and down the aisles. <laughs> You can't keep it inside all the time, all right? But if I were to summarize this text, if you let your bull out into the, uh, the freeway of the, the apartment building, and it is known as a, a person goring bull. <laughs> and it happens to gore an individual. You go zipping down the hall, you find dead neighbor number 302 next door and you say uh oh now uh, from a biblical perspective you want to check the name tag to see if it's a free person or a slave you know and uh, from a biblical perspective if it kills a sleep free person a free man or woman uh, the bull is to be stoned and the owner shall be put to death if the bull gore is a male or female slave you pay some shekels, and the bull dies. I'm thinking to myself, and I sigh. You know, I got. I, 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 sometimes I get asked, why the insidious title to your book? You know, slaves, women, and homosexuals. Could you not have picked three more contentious words? I, and, and, you know, I guess it, it, it's because slavery for me is in some respects a neutral issue. We should have learned the lessons of interpreting scripture through the window of slavery a long time ago. The Brits have done better. The Americans, perchance by accident of military history, not by rigorous theology. But if you have a bull, don't let him go goring people unless the person is a slave. Otherwise, it'll be very, very costly. Third area, say uh, sexual violation, free versus slave. Um, if, uh, if out in the country a man happens to meet a free girl, pledged to be married and rapes her, only the man who has done this shall die. Do nothing to the girl. She has committed no sin deserving of death. All right, sounds okay. But then you have the situation with the slave girl. Okay, if a man sleeps with a slave girl, um, there, is, uh, there must be punishment, but notice the difference. The man is not put to death uh, because she has not yet been freed. And so we go through the Asham offering. And I say, ah, ooh, that's a tough one. You know, my my uh, my dean uh, at one point uh, threw Paul Kurtz's book on my my desk, and uh, it's a humanist ethic book, and he acts a uh, thread scripture, you know, and says a humanist ethic can do a whole lot better job. Throw the Bible in the trash can, and, and he cites texts like this, and he cites a good number of women texts. And so my dean was reading that. Uh, he's, uh, at that particular time he taught ethics, and he threw the book on my desk and said, Bill, you're the exegete. You figure it out. 
And I said, oh, sure, boss, uh, I'll have it by the weekend, you know. <laughs> but texts like this plagued my, my life ever since that journey down to Baltimore where we started talking about slavery as a family. And, and my parents were Christians. They didn't, they didn't put together the jigsaw puzzle. But, you know, they're telling me, no, it's not a good thing. Well, I, 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 what I'm going to do is talk about a redemptive movement hermeneutic, if we can get that word into one package, uh, and uh, tonight, and, and I want to conceptualize it in terms of things that you already know and then take you into Scripture. I want to talk about two things. Remember the pipe. Um, <clears throat> uh, my father, being a health minister in Canada, deputy minister of health during Mark Lalonde years, told me that he had to fight tooth and nail just to get the crossbones on smoking packages. The medical community knew 50 years beforehand that it was killing people, okay? But just to get to that point of putting a skull and crossbones on a package of cigarettes. Now, for the last 10 years in my hermeneutics class in seminary, I've been telling my students this. You wait. It'll happen. I said, eventually, somewhere in the world, they'll start outlawing smoking of adults in cars with children. This last December, it came in the papers. Nova Scotia, of all places. Some, I don't know, Kingsville, something or other, Northville of Nova Scotia, did it. And now it's on the docket of Ontario provincial legislation. And I say, how did you know that? I said, it is a logical extension of the spirit of smoking laws that have come all along. Okay. While over in Britain uh, last summer, we were sitting uh, eating fish and chips, and they were all moaning that next Saturday, all of the bars, they couldn't smoke in again. <laughs> and we were just chuckling as Canadians, because that's 10 years ago for us, you know? <laughs> Maybe 15, I don't know. And all of our owners said, we're going to go out of business, you know. <laughs> Never happened. But often social change, and social change towards the better, is slow. It's difficult. It's hard to back all the vested interests that, that people have in this whole process. And, and now, I, I, I illustrate with a second factor, and that is a gas can. You should probably never bring this together with this. <laughs> um, it, 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 at least not an igniting factor. I assure you, it is empty, so you can not steal it after um, <laughs> the... It could sell for a fortune. Um, but if you think about legislation, uh, Europe, for instance, has had legislation on the books promoting um, greener cars for, for a good number of years now. Okay. But if you think about the entangled web of ethics in terms of gasoline and oil and all of the things that are going on and swirling in our world right now, uh, it is very, very difficult to move people along. And, and sometimes you have to move at incremental steps in the process, you know. Um, it is an embedded factor. And those are two that we know from our own. And, and, and I, then I ask myself, well, how should we read the Bible? And I gotta say, in the last 20 years, I've made a significant change. I don't read it the same way I did 20 years ago. Do we read it in a static sense? Now, a static sense is taking the, the page of Scripture and reading a, a piece of Scripture up and down on that page. You know what? That's actually better than most Christians because most Christians just rip it out of the context. But, but, but at least reading it within the, on the page. At least you get a literary context. Uh, but why would I argue that, that that doesn't give you the whole of the meaning of the text? that there is a whole nother context that we, we need to think about that gives us a genuine sense of meaning within those words that's called movement meaning. In fact, just in case you miss what I want to argue for tonight, uh, in a non-argumentative sense, 
I want to suggest that movement is meaning. Movement is crucial meaning. Many biblical texts do not reflect an ultimate ethic. So when I'm talking to my neighbors about the slavery beating text, or I've actually done this debate on university campuses, I, I say you're right. This is not ultimate ethic. Many biblical texts do not reflect an ultimate ethic in terms of their concrete specificity. Now oh, that's an important addendum. Rather, what goes on in the biblical text is that the biblical texts reflect incremental movement. Now that's very, oh, I love that word, incremental movement. Ah. Beautiful word. Incremental movement towards an ultimate ethic. Now, you know, some of us learn better through sports. And uh, if you're such, let's talk about football. If you can figure out football, then you can figure out a redemptive movement approach. <laughs> if you can't figure out football, well, I have a Football for Dummies book for myself because I watch my son's game. At any rate, the ultimate ethic is way down there, okay, the yellow yardage. And on this particular field, it is 80, uh, 80 yards to a touchdown, okay, if we're going in that direction. Uh, 80 yards, number 65, and you go to a touchdown, and uh, I, basically that is often where the culture of an A&E ancient or eastern culture was in terms of social ethics many times and what happens in the old testament is the old testament is it what's that word i love incrementally, incrementally. yeah it pushes it incrementally not all the way to a touchdown necessarily and the new testament comes along pushes a little bit further but not all necessarily to touch now that's very very important for christians to figure out that's a, for me, it was a paradigm shift. It was a totally different way of reading scripture. So the biblical texts often reflect incremental movement towards an ultimate ethic in their concrete specificity. By application, then, we must capture the movement meaning within the biblical text. Redemptive movement. We must capture the redemptive spirit within the biblical text. We must hear the redemptive spirit. And so that's the, the picture that you have in front of you. If we were to just zero in on the, uh, the first uh, look there, uh, if you isolate the words of Scripture on the page and read them alone without their social context, it's an on-the-page configuration of ethics. But if you're in how they hear in the ancient context, all of a sudden you hear something that is contained within those concrete specific words, and that is the redemptive spirit. And then you say, ooh, ooh, am I going to get locked into the concrete specificity? Is that where God really wants my life to lie? Or does God want me to understand the concrete specificity, but the underlying canonical context? Well, I suspect movement is meaning. Okay? Movement is crucial meaning. It's not the only meaning within the biblical text, but it's a very crucial meaning. And we could develop it. These are the ones that I've been working on and writing in. I have, uh, my wife and I are actually working on one with respect to CP, and uh, that's not cotton pajamas if you were in my seminar this afternoon, uh, and uh, one on war texts. But I will tonight just talk about the slavery text. Let's talk about that beating text, okay? What do I say to the university professors this is no ethic, okay? Let me tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says you can beat the living schmuck out of your slave as long as he gets up after a day or two. Up after a day or two. That's your God? 
Yeah. I said, well, well, yeah, that doesn't sound very good, does it? You're right. I said, but I think you read the text wrong. No, he says, I read the text right. He zips over and gets a copy of the text, opens this up. Exodus 21, 20 through 21. Let me read what the text says. He reads it. And I say again. And after he says to me, that's your God? I say, yeah, yeah, it is, but I think you read the text wrong. And then he gets indignant and says, why? I said, well... I, I don't think, I think you're reading it in terms of literary context up and down the page, but you're not hearing it in terms of a broader context, an ancient world. You see, let's listen to the text of Exodus 21 within an ancient Near Eastern world. In an ancient Near Eastern world, a master could do anything to their slave. They could beat the living life out of them. Boom! Okay? with no recrimination. Is there movement from that to where Scripture is? Yes, there is some movement. Furthermore, let me show you a beating passage. It's actually in the same context, just down the page. In Exodus 21, 26 through 27, and in that particular text, it says that if in beating a slave, you knock out an eye or a tooth or, or disfigure the slave in any way, guess what? The slave goes free. Now, I, want to, I want you to hear that within an ancient or Eastern world, where the meaning and the, uh, the conscious, intentional disfigurement of slaves for social control was very important. So if you have a slave who runs away, you lop, lop off a toe or a leg or something. If you have a mouthy slave, you rip out the tongue. The slave who doesn't hear you chop off the ear. All kinds of mutilation of slaves. No thought given to it. Scripture comes along and says, you touch a slave, you harm a slave, you injure a slave. In terms of permanent dismemberment, permanent disfigurement, they go free. And you know what I got to say to that? To my neighbor? To the professor on, on, a, on another campus? I say, guess what? All of a sudden I hear something in the text. It's a small little word. It goes, wow! You know? I said, that's my God. And, and, and then I, I, I take them to a text like Deuteronomy 23. And in that text it says... If you have a slave that runs away from a foreign country to Israel and uh, they choose to do that, you are not to send them back to their country of origin. They are free within Israel and you are to embrace them. And we read that today and say, ho oh, hum, I've got to find a different passage to preach on for Sunday because that doesn't ring, you know? But if you read that in an ancient or eastern world where extradition treaties were the norm for every single country. In fact, even if you aided and abetted a slave, a runaway slave, it often caused you death or, or members of, of the slave's family death. You know? And, and all ancient or eastern countries that I know of had extradition treaties. And all of a sudden you start reading scripture and in the middle of that kind of scene, in the middle of that kind of social ethic, Scripture says, no! All of Israel is a city or a country of refuge for runaway slaves. And I've got to say that little English word of three letters again. Wow! Redemptive movement! I'm hearing something that wasn't that is contained in the words on the page, but is contained in the words on the page as they read within their broader social context. So ancient or eastern. And then, of course, uh, O.T. Ger to T.J. Well, that basically is movement from the Old Testament to the New Testament, movement from Greco-Roman to New Testament, movement from Second Temple Judaism to New Testament. Uh, and we could, we could develop all of those, but let, let's just... Uh, well, let's back up on that. Galatians, of course, comes along, and Paul does it in other epistles, uh, where he says uh, that no longer in Christ, in the in Christ community, 
uh, in the new humanity that God is creating. No longer is there either slave nor free. A and again, you know, in, in our abolitionist context, it, it sounds okay, but you got to have that sense within the original context where, you know, you don't have that order in that world. And all of a sudden, in Christ, there is a new ordering of humanity in a phenomenal way. And I talk to my neighbors at a New Year's Eve party, and I say, you read the text wrong. There's a wonderful redemptive spirit. Now, I've got to admit that as Christians, often, you know, we, we, we get it in our mind that we have to stay with Scripture in terms of where it fossilizes in terms of an ethic. But there is a huge redemptive movement within Scripture and a wonderful wow. And it is a logical and theological extension of the redemptive spirit of Scripture. It is that that cogently takes us to the abolition of slavery. Um, it is not any explicit teaching or pronouncement by Paul. Go ye and be abolitionists, free all your slaves. We don't get that in the New Testament. But we get huge incremental movement, especially read relative to their particular social context. And so, if you haven't already watched these wonderful movies, I've given you some hard, rigorous homework to help you think through a redemptive movement hermeneutic. Movie number one, The Almost Thought. How many have seen that one? Okay. All right, half of you haven't. All right, okay. Make it a date night. It, it, it's cool. Uh, Spielberg movie. And, uh, of course, it's, it's a movie about a slave ship that winds up uh, initially in Spain where the trade is made, and then it goes off, and there's an insurrection. They wind up over in Britain. Okay. And it goes to the British courts. All right? And they have to decide whose ship is it, whose slave, who owns the slaves. And, of course, someone is working in the background. Um, and there is a whole lot of movement and thinking there already with respect to slavery. And eventually they go free. I showed this movie in Ethiopia to a very sensitive group. <laughs> and unlike our context... My students over there, 34 of them, they all stood up and cheered at that point in the movie when the slaves went free in England. Only to find out that the whole thing went down in the soup again and it had to be fought out in the States. And if you've seen the movie, of course, you know, there's huge dejection because the, the, uh, you know, the decision in England is being held up or bound by what happens uh, in the United States of America. And as you think about what is being discussed during the time of the Civil War and pre-Civil War uh, in Congress times, some Christians do not have an agenda of abolitionism. In fact, many Christians, I would say by far the majority of Christians, um, had an agenda of bringing the slavery in the United States up to the level, at least, of the concrete specific slavery in the Scripture. <laughs> they lost the redemptive spirit of it altogether. So that what they were arguing for was that we reduce the quota of slaves being brought in. Now, they were at least doing incremental movement, yeah, but they were in doing incremental movement uh, to, uh, to wipe out the influx of foreign slaves. You see in, in literature in the States the incremental decrease in bringing in foreign slaves. On the other hand, there were some Christians who were abolitionists. 
And, and they saw the redemptive spirit of Scripture and said, no, the logical trajectory of that is the abolition of these people. That if you take that redemptive spirit, especially as we hear the text in its original context, whoa, God is doing something. And they were willing to go further. But you want to think that through as, as you watch that movie. And of course, the other one is Amazing Grace, uh, the movie uh, which is behind the hymn. Uh, a, a wonderful movie, uh, William Wilberforce and uh, the movement in England. Um, and and uh, again, it's, it's not one that necessarily reflects on, uh, on deep theological thinking, uh, per se, or even hermeneutics, per se. But, but I do think it would help you see uh, the involvement of people in every fabric of society. It wasn't William Wilberforce alone who could push the, for that change. It was someone in political power. It was someone in the church. It was someone, oh, a business person. It was, a, it was all across. Not unlike this group here. And, and uh, uh, amazing change as, uh, as the movie shows. And, and I guess, I guess, for many years, as a Canadian, I'm particularly proud of the heritage that Canada has in, in bringing slaves up out of uh, the States. And I'm particularly proud that many Christians were involved in that, both within the States as well as Canada. But there are a few flies in the ointment to that story. I have preached a couple of times at two black churches in downtown Toronto. And when I was at those churches, I, I asked them this. I said, why, why didn't you join? Why didn't you join the other churches here? You know, 100 years later plus, and they're still not joined. And they said, well, when we came up to Canada, we tried to. You know, this is a generation or two later, so we're talking to the people who look after the archives and retell the story. When they, tr when they came up to Canada, they tried to join the Baptists and the Presbyterians, etc. But they were told this, no, you can't join until you do, one of, you do two things, actually. First of all, you have to have a letter from your church in the United States, a, a letter of recommendation, yeah. You think you're going to get that? A white church in the same? Yeah. And secondly, you have to have a letter from your former uh, employer, uh, slave owner, saying that you were emancipated in proper fashion. A and I, I nearly cried. With, I said, that's what they did? I said, you've lived this legacy here? In Canada, I was outraged. In Canada, I thought I had to go to the States to get that. <laughs> Dang, you know. Well, the, the question that the slavery text posed for all of our lives is how. How are we going to apply scripture? What moves you in your application of scripture? How do we let the Bible and its authority shape our contemporary actions? Are we willing to carry further the redemptive spirit of the biblical text? Are we willing to carry further, even in today's context, the redemptive spirit of the slavery texts? There are all parts of this world that are broken and hurting, and people in poverty, uh, and, and even physical slavery is still part of our world. But the spirit of the biblical text is where, over 20 years, I've learned 
to zoom in and focus on in terms of what I see as God ultimately wanting me to do. And if, if, if I stay with the concrete specificity of the biblical ethic, many times I have opted for the inferior. That God wants us as Christians to think through what the logical trajectory of this text is and move with that. Thank you very much.